Smoke signals from around the campfire. So this is a, a joining together of the two communities, Campfire Convention and uh, Ian's Nature World Connection. Nature Connection World. Nature Connection World as well, yeah. Yeah, Nature World it's, Connection. It's called Conjunction. Nature World Connection. Nature, Nature Connection, Connection World. World. So, um, yeah, would you like to say a few words about your community to kick off, Ian, for those of us here from the campfire end of things? Yeah, yes. Um, I had I had an idea. I, I, I used to be on Facebook. I used to um, run everything I was doing on Facebook. And then I got a sense. I got a sense to move something, something inside me um, was urging me to to move. And so I started exploring other um, platforms and came across Mighty Networks. And there were a lot of other people on Mighty Networks that I admired and I trusted. And so I, I opened up Nature Connection World in um, 2021, June 2021, so it's nearly two years old now. I was the only one in here back then when I wandered in, but I had a lot of friends that were on still on Facebook and uh, a lot of guides, natural mindfulness guides that I've been training over the years as well, who I encouraged to come and join me on the network with the aim to increase nature consciousness. So if we could, if we could reconnect more people to nature, and our true nature, my belief is that we'll, we, can, uh, we can reach a, a tipping point whereby um, we can access the healing power of nature and uh, nature can access the healing power of human consciousness as well. So, and we're growing, we're growing. And uh, we've got some big changes coming in 2023 to help us develop even further. And part of that is to start to um, connect outside of nature connection world with other mighty networks like yours pete and and others where uh, we're aligned so that um we have uh, you know, the power comes from community very much so yeah and i feel a lot of alignment with the work you're doing and it's great that we're both on each other's networks as well yeah. And similarly, we're working with Elevate, another mighty network community in this year's camp out with the two main um, hosts and organizers there with uh, Dan Astin Gregory. Um, I'm just going to pin myself here. Um, so we're going to have a slightly different format. Um, what we usually do with the camp out gatherings, which are usually on Sunday mornings every week at the moment, um, is to for everyone to have a check in of um, two or three minutes each. Um, We've got quite a few here, so we'd take up <laughs> the best part of the session if we did that. But I think there'll be plenty of opportunity for everyone to check in later later on in the session um, to tell, <clears throat> tell us how you're feeling, any questions or points arising from what um, Ian and myself are going to talk about. Um, we had a, our first um, Zoom chat in quite a while, well, probably ever, actually. Um, so we met in, I think, 2018 at the Tree Conference in Fruit, and there was a lot of alignment there. And then, of course, um, something came along that kept us from gathering in fields for a couple of years. Um, so I'd, I'd like to, I've got various um, key words that I underlined from our chat, things mm -hmm. like wilderness, um, emergence, flow, nature consciousness, zinc spark. <laughs> <laughs> um, tantra was another one that cropped up. All sorts of things that we, we might or might not touch on. It, the conversation will be as emergent as ever, I guess. Um, so I wanted to really open up by asking you about the last three years. At the start of our conversation, um, you were talking about how it's been a good discipline for you. Um, and a lot of the damage done has been through not being able to express ourselves. Um, I was noting that down from our chat. So would you like to extrapolate on that? Um, yeah, yes. I mean, what comes to mind when you say that is um, actually takes me back further than the last three years. But the last three years, um, I think um, something that happened to me in 2009 had a big bearing on now. It's interesting because I, I felt I felt a similar urge that I felt um, 
three years ago and I felt in 2009, I felt it just before the millennium. So, you know, I, I, was, I was born in the, in the last millennium. <laughs> and uh, and, and I, felt, I, I felt as we were getting closer to uh, the, 20, 20, the 21st century, that I just felt there was an urgency, there was a quickening to get change track. And that, 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 that ended up in, a, in sort of a crash of my old life, um, right at the, that time, which, which was quite transformational. Um, I felt it coming and I felt that urge happening. But in 2009, which was nine years after then, um, when I had recovered and I was, I was sort of on, on a, a more nature conscious path, I discovered a lump in my throat and it was, uh, it was a lump on my thyroid. And what, what basically happened was I ended up going into hospital and having my throat cut and half of my thyroid removed. But on the side of my thyroid was a big, long, benign growth that was growing down the side of, of my, um, what that part is. I can't, I'm not medically aware of what it was. Sorry, Simon. Was that a soft? The esophagus, that's it, yeah, yeah, it was growing down into the, ch into the chest cavity, and, um, and that was taken out, and, and, I, and it, I saw it for, for a while, I thought I had a muscular voice box, because I was a trainer and a coach, and I used my voice a lot, so I thought I'd had a muscular voice box till a, till a surgeon <laughs> explained to me that it's not a muscular voice box, you know, just because you talk a lot, it doesn't mean you have a muscular voice box, um, and it was this growth, and it was a lump in my throat, and that kind of reminded me of when I was a child, and Whenever I wanted to try and express myself and I wanted to share how I emotionally felt, I had this lump. I used to feel an emotional lump in my, and I, and I couldn't, I couldn't actually get the words out. Um, sometimes they would come out, and we talked about this, sometimes the words would come out very, very short and sharp. Um, and it was almost like I could just get that out. I could just sort of maybe have an expletive about something to express how upset I was, but I couldn't articulate. Um, because I had an emotional lump in my throat. So, so a very wise person said to me, I mean, the, the, the surgeon, you know, it was great. I, I went and I had that half removed. I did have a long debate with him about, you know, was it necessary to cut half of a workforce because a company wasn't operating properly? And I used that metaphor. And he said, well, basically, if the companies potentially could go bust, um, maybe yes. Yeah. So I kind of got that it was quite serious for them to, to do that, to check. And, um, and so I, I'm, I'm happy that I did that, but obviously I had some, some work to do myself to heal that. Um, there was much more than just, there was a reason why there was that growth there, I felt. And it was linked to this emotional lump in my throat. And I felt that I made a promise to myself in 2009 while I was lying in hospital with my throat cut and the little bottle catching, carrying all the, the stuff that comes out from operations and things. I scared my children when they came in to see me. I, I didn't know what I looked like, but I could see in their face what I looked like in terms of staples here and things. And um, I made a promise to myself that I would always speak my truth. I would, now the lump had been removed, I would speak my truth. And so that was 2009. But what that meant was that when, when we got to three years ago, and I was starting to see things on the, the TV and read things in the newspaper and feeling that I was kind of, there was something not natural or not right for me. Something didn't, I had to say something. I had to sort of start speaking out. So I started just sharing what I do, which is Nature Connection. I started sharing about, you know, how I very rarely take tablets for anything. I don't really take medication unless I'm seriously ill, which is very rare. Um, I'm not against medications for people that need them, but I just felt that, you know, for somebody like me, um, going into nature, breathing fresh air, drinking enough water, sleeping well, eating good food, um, mindfulness practice, uh, being connected to not just my thoughts and not just my feelings, but also being connected to my instinct and my intuition as well. I have a very good understanding of how I work. I know that there's an instinctive part of me, which is quite primitive and not necessarily as mature as some of the other parts of elements of my nature. Uh, I also have feelings, I also have thoughts and I think things through, um, but I'm also intuitive. And I've realized the difference between my instinct and my intuition is that my instinct is an unconscious knowing and my intuition is a conscious knowing. And so there's a journey from unconscious knowing through instinct, through feelings, through thoughts into intuition which is a con which is conscious knowing, which is then 
what I call nature consciousness, which is evolving consciousness, not just evolving as a, as a physical body, but evolving consciousness as well. And so I started speaking out and I started sort of promoting what I was doing, which is what I always do. I, and I'm not saying everybody should follow what I do. I say you can adopt what works and you can adapt what doesn't, or you can just keep on doing what you're doing. And that's how I am with things. I just share that with people. Um, I shared a little bit too much um, for some people. So they didn't like it. Um, but um, for me, what it, what it meant was I had to start to practice what I was teaching, preaching through my work um, with nature consciousness. I can't do anything that I feel isn't aligned with my true nature and so I've been on a journey to understand what what my true nature is and I believe that that might be the journey that everybody else is on to try and discover um, heal understand and release their own true nature I don't know did I answer your did I did I cover that yeah <laughs> for a lot of people the word nature is still something that they see as separate from themselves and I think Certainly for me in the last few years, there's been, particularly in the, the early days of the lockdown, when there wasn't really much, many places we could go. And to go into nature, whether it was a local park, mm. I, I was lucky enough to be in Tynmouth in Devon, so I could walk along the beach. And I really connected there, but it was much deeper than just seeing the beauty of nature. It was a mm. fundamental connection with nature. And I noticed, I think we both noticed in the conversation we had last week that language also comes into it the way we express ourselves and that sense of understanding of gathering wisdom and the words we choose to articulate more and more words to do with nature are coming into everyday conversation but i'm also finding them coming into business um, parlance as well and mm. all sorts of unusual areas i wouldn't have expected are drawing analogies with seasonal changes with um, nature connection in its broadest sense yeah yeah i mean it's, there's even um it even goes further than nature connection now which is to nature connectedness which is a meaningful connection with nature so we could all get we can go out into nature and walk our dogs and we can you know listen to our favorite podcast while we're walking through a lovely woodland or we could chat with somebody alongside us or, or do some sort of physical activity which is good it's good for us we we, we benefit from some from from just being in that environment but the um but going back to the words you know I, I i encourage people not to say i spend time in nature i encourage them to say i invest time with nature because if you invest with some if you spend i've spent i've wasted a lot of money that i've spent on stuff that actually once i've had it for a while i've, I've just thought what did i buy that that wasn't great whereas whereas now um, I've also invested in some bad things, but now I'm very consciously aware of what I'm investing in. And I see it as an investment of time. And often the biggest, the biggest thing that people say to me is that I don't have time to spend in there. I can't spend time in nature and, and, um, and justify it to people, to myself, to spend that time. And so this is where I, I, you know, I try and get people to recognize it's an investment, um, which you will get. That, that investment back, so that time back with interest, which is often um, re-energized, much more energy and insight and, and creativity because you know, a human body is, is very much like a smartphone. Um, we're not very smart. This, the phone isn't very smart when it's not plugged into an energy source and it's not regularly plugged into the internet. Well, to me, I'm not very smart if I'm not plugged into nature that re-energizes me and plugged into you know a, a, a sort of a, a nature consciousness this this ability to think clearly and think articulately um, a, and look at nature look at look at how nature behaves and how nature is because when we look closely and we listen and we sense we actually see how we are so far removed from it because we don't operate like nature operates Another word that came up in our conversation was the word wilderness, which I know has a resonance for you. I think mm. you're doing courses around wilderness, but for me that that resonated with the sort of shadow side of what I might be going through on a personal level, what we might be going through as a society. Then I've heard the expression brought up a lot about in the wilderness or mm. looking around for our sense of direction. So I'd love to hear you talk a bit more about 
um, obviously wilderness relates to the word wild. It's very, it's very essence is around the word wild. So how do you see the wilderness at the moment? Uh, well, the wild, the wilderness, um, it's almost like we're not allowed to go there <laughs> and there isn't a lot of it left. I mean, I think here in the UK, the only real wild wilderness is up in the top of Scotland somewhere. I don't think, um, and there are some places in Europe that, that are still regarded as wilderness. Um, and obviously around the world, there's still some wilderness, thank goodness. Um, but we're not, we're, one is we're not encouraged to go there and, and can't get access to, to it. Um, and secondly, um, there's a fear about the wilderness. I mean, I've been safer in, in, in forests than I am walking along the streets in a city. I'm mean, much more at risk wandering around a city um, than I am wandering around in nature. But there is a sense that nature is a dangerous place and it's something um, to be scared of. And I, you know, I, I remember listening to fairy tales as a child and it was always about, there was a big bad wolf hiding behind a tree to get you. But I suspect that, that big bad wolf actually was a human in wolf's clothing. Uh, so there's always, there's always uh, it's usually a human being that's the problem rather than the natural world. Um, uh, but the but I think we've we've lost we've lost our connection to the wilderness of nature, um, and because we, we've lost the connection to the wilderness in us. And I you know I talked about um, instinct, and one of the reasons why I'd lost connection with instinct was because that how I reacted instinctively particularly when life was stressful and difficult and hard, was not, was not acceptable in society. Um, I couldn't scream and shout and, and say things and upset people. I mean, how difficult is it now to upset people? <laughs> you know, I, I upset my 11-year-old daughter by, you know, I, I used a word she really didn't like and she told me I can't say things like that. Well, I, you know, the trouble is I shouldn't have an 11-year-old daughter at my age at 62 because, you know, I, I can't remember when it was okay to say to say certain things but she's like oh no 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 you can't say that um, and I, I didn't mean any harm by it I'm just I'm just repeating language but uh, and sometimes when I'm angry and I I sometimes say things that I shouldn't say as well and she's got a little swear jar now that she she's making quite a lot of money out of daddy when he says says words that he shouldn't say in the house which is I've just been teaching her swear words are really good you just don't say them in front of granny and it's and, and swear words are really good if they're appropriate uh, so, you know, if you bang your thumb with something and, you know, saying that, it, 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 it some way it, it, it frees us up sometimes to just be able to express how we're truly feeling and just go ah! and say it. Um, you know, I, it was a time I had to go and scream at trees because no human being could, <laughs> could let me scream at them and not take offense. Anyway, I'm saying this isn't personal. I just, I'm just trying to show you how I feel inside right now. And the only way you can understand this is by me expressing it. And now you can see it. And I, I won't touch you, but I might scare you, you know, because I'm barking a lot and snarling a lot. And so for me, it was about learning to, to recognize that part of my nature, which could be seen as shadow. You know, there are parts of our nature that are in shadow because I think we shine too bright a light on this on the acceptable parts of our nature. Because you know, I, I was brought up to be to be a good person and to please people and go in the right direction. So do the right thing and be good. Well, it's hard to do the right thing and be good, um, especially when you've got two people telling you what the right thing is and multiple people telling you what's good and what's bad. You know, it's so difficult to try and try and please everybody because um, you might you might do quite well at it but I guarantee you if you're trying to please everybody you won't be pleasing yourself you'll be having to change who you are change your nature maybe even corrupt your nature to a degree in order to please someone else and so there's too much light on I think um, being good 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 little people <laughs> and do the, doing the right thing um, but that makes us good employees, doesn't it? You know, if we do things right and we, and, and we don't upset people, that's a really good employee. Because the alternative is, is you just say, oh, sod it, I'm gonna do what I wanna do and I'm gonna win and I'm going to be free. Um, and so for me, it's like, well, you know, how, how, do you, how do you win and be free if you've always got to please people and you can't get things wrong? I mean, it's very difficult very difficult but it's, that's the so to me it's the you know we put too much if you put too much light on that those those wanting to be free wanting to be a bit rebellious and go left when everybody tells you you're supposed to go right and and to not upset people 
even when you inside are feeling like it's justified to actually say how I feel, that means we're, we're not in balance. And, and so we can't regulate ourselves very well. So to me, it's, it's bringing all of those parts <clears throat> of us into balance is, um, it's, so it's going to those wild places, going to those, um, you know, exploring um, those places and understanding them so that we can find the balance in them. Does, does that sort of help? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, often the shadow is where we learn the most. If yeah. we're coming out, an be interesting. Be, I was going to say it would be interesting because I'm looking at people. Some people are nodding. Some people are kind of <laughs> going and getting a cup of coffee. So it's it's I um you know it'd be interesting to hear what what others you know if, if that makes sense to other people or um you know anything that's come up while I've been saying that. Yeah, I mean, maybe this is a good point to bring other people in. Really. Mm. Um, I was also going to ask you about, you mentioned your daughter and there was one story about her reacting to some shouting and forming an opinion that we talked about. We, yes, yes. Well, it is. It's interesting because children are so, children are closer to nature, aren't they, than we are. And I was, I was in town with my eldest daughter, who's in her 30s now, but she was, she was probably about four, four years old and she was skipping around town. And I remember she was dressed as a little fairy going around town like children do at that age. I think she's probably trying to bring a little bit of, uh, forest glade to a to a busy high street and in in the high street outside one of the banks um, one of the banks i think have been accused of funding some laboratory um, animal testing and so there are a lot of um, people outside of the bank demonstrating um, animal rights people there who were who you know they they felt they were doing a, a great thing and, and they were they were demonstrating and they were shouting and holding placards with with animals in these laboratories which is very distressing and my daughter looked up and said why do those people shouting want to hurt animals daddy and in that moment i thought gosh yes Be because of their behavior because they're getting angry because they're getting upset and because they haven't uh, they haven't worked on maturing what I call our inner hunter and inner huntress, the part of us that's there to protect us and what we care about. If, because they, they'd always suppressed it usually, which is what most people do, they suppress it until they can't suppress it anymore. And then it comes out. And my daughter thought it was them that were hurting animals, not the bank. She, the bank was just sitting quietly there and, and <laughs> nobody from the bank was out saying anything. So she never, she never connected what they were saying. And often that's what happens, isn't it? People, people judge us by our behavior and how we sound. Um, and I think it's for us to learn how to use this wilder <laughs> side, this protective inner hunter or inner huntress in, in, and, and not tame it because that's totally unnatural. It's not to be tamed, but it's to mature. And it's for us to understand how best to focus that energy. Um, I always say it's best not to lose your temper, it's best to use your temper. And I don't, and, and I like the word temper and I like the word um, rage because rage, you can put heart into rage and you get the word courage. Um, courage is heartful rage. And I just think that's wonderful. Passion's much better than anger. I always say to people, I'm not angry, I'm really passionate. Um, if you wanna see anger, I'll show you anger. So you can see the difference between me angry and me passionate. Um, that's my hunter actually being a little bit more articulate. <laughs> you mentioned bringing people into the conversation yes let's let's if anyone, do, would, if anyone would like to speak please raise a digital hand which you can find in the menu reactions the bottom menu uh, there's a raise hand um so if you'd like to raise it if there's anything you under want under reactions isn't it yeah under yeah. reactions so is there any points on what we've been um, bringing up so there we go simon's there and David. Go for it, Simon. Uh, yeah, good evening, David. Uh, uh, good evening, Ian. Hello. Um, yeah, it was interesting. I, I, I'm involved with a, a, a local organization near Salisbury. It's called Hazel Hill. And one of the things I've been doing a lot is, is, is connecting with nature. And it was very interesting your point about people can be in nature without connecting to it. Um, and I think that's the diff, that's the thing that we're missing. Is, is, is that connection it's it goes much deeper than just being in a wood i was very conscious when we had all those that trouble with people uh during the covid where they were all heading to the beach or wherever and leaving an absolute mess that was unbelievable yeah. i thought well who are these people where are they come from 
do people really treat the world the wild like that um and uh, was it someone mentioned tantra was it you pete i can't remember just now yeah. um i've also uh, brought that in as well or others have brought that in to nature connection so i think yeah it's 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 getting what we need to push push is for that connection to nature that goes deeper than just being there in my experience so i agree with that how would you say you'd go about doing that simon i think people have got to spend not just a day and you've got you actually got to, you've got to stay in it to camp out there you know sleep under the stars a bit or um perhaps spend some time more than just going to cycle through it or walk through it i think you need to you need to engage with it somehow if it's doing conservation work or uh, doing some sort of spiritual practice, whether it's yoga or that ecstatic dance you saw, it, you saw at the beginning, which is great. Ecstatic dance in nature is brilliant thing to do. So, yeah, things like also that. Also worth saying that you've started an off-grid circle in the campfire as well, um, which we're hoping to get off the ground properly in the next few weeks. Um, Ian, any, any points on what Simon came back with? Yeah, I... I recognize that I started to get um, my mindfulness was 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 tested to the limit um, during lockdowns because I, I liked the fact that I was seeing people responding the way I'd responded years before when I'd lost touch with nature. And then when something happened in my life, I found the urge to go into nature. And it was interesting how many people felt this urge to go into nature. I think if the pubs and the restaurants were all closed, it was like, well, what do we do? And this, and it, what they chose to do was go into nature, into natural spaces. But it, 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 it's absolutely right. It needs to be done with mindfulness. It needs to be done with awareness, awarefulness, which is a, a, a better way of saying mindfulness is awarefulness. Um, and recognizing that, you know, if somebody comes to my house, I, I would, I would, I would expect them to honor the fact that it's my house. And, you know, if I said, oh, would you mind taking your, your shoes off before you come walking in across the floors? We've just cleaned them, whatever. And people would, would be quite happy to, to take their shoes off. And, and people would not just come walking into my house who I didn't even know and just barge in and help themselves to some food out of my fridge. But people don't appreciate that that's what nature is. Nature is a home to, to thousands of species, probably more. And we just go waltzing into it, walking into it without any conscious awareness that this is a this is a home you know we we carve through a forest we carve a road through a forest without any understanding that the forest isn't just above ground the forest is below ground as well and if you carve a road through the center of it you've destroyed thousands of years of growth under the surface and then there's all these all these invisible pathways that animals have been using for again now, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years of, of, of trodden pathways that you suddenly stick a great big road through it and that those animals are going to try and follow the same path they've always tried to follow, regardless of the fact you've just stuck a great big road through it. So it's, it's, it's I think we need to recognise that this isn't our planet, this isn't our nature, and there needs to be guides to do that. And this is why I'm so keen, and there are lots of guides here from Nature Connection World tonight, which is great seeing them here, um, because... For me, I can't do it on my own. I need, I need, I need people not just go, you know, going into nature, but I need people actually learning how and, and appreciating how to guide others to do that so that when they go and do it on their own, they do it with responsibility. They do it with a conscious awareness of it's not just about them knowing nature, but it's about nature knowing them as well. Because when you walk into a forest, nature's knowing you, nature's listening to you, it's feeling you, it's hearing you. There's a two-way thing here. And if we forget that nature is two-way, it's like forgetting that trees give us oxygen. I mean, some people have forgotten that trees give us oxygen. I mean, without trees and plants, we wouldn't have, any, we wouldn't have much oxygen. Um, and, and trees need our carbon dioxide. You know, they need the carbon. So you know, if we're pumping carbon out of ourselves, well, the trees will have that, thanks very much. And then they'll give us oxygen back. But get rid of all the trees. And um, you know, we, might, we might run out of oxygen. Who knows? Do you get the sense of that mankind's predominance over nature, as it's been seen in recent years, recent decades, is beginning to break down on any meaningful scale? Is it a, a gradual thing? Is it really that shift of consciousness that we can put out into the ether just through every conversation, every action, every 
lesson every community gathering um, i'll say it quickly because there's hands up and I, I want others to have have a say but I, I believe there's a seed of nature consciousness in everybody there's a seed there and now with some people those seeds have germinated and they're growing and they're and whatever the plant is has come above the ground and it's out there and it's already attracting bees and flat and butterflies and everything else and I'm, I'm i'm doing my best to get more of those seeds out there growing um but i but i also think there's a lot of them that are still dormant there are a lot of them that haven't had the zinc spark, which you were talking about earlier on, hasn't yeah. happened yet. Um, so, so I think, you know, the more, I, I, I think nature wants there to be a, a stronger connection. It, you know, I think there is a, a force in nature, natural law, which we can follow. And I'll, I might talk about that a little bit later on, um, but I, I'd be interested to hear what Diane, Ken and David want to, yeah. want David. to share. Hi. Hi, everybody. Hi, David. Um, uh, I was I, I was sort of jotting down a few a few thoughts I I had on this because I think it's probably fair to say that this is sort of sort of an unfamiliar territory to me really but I think my my instant reaction was that to talk really about an unconscious nature connection um, rather than a conscious one um, and following on from that it seems to me that because most of us for years and years have had a probably an unconscious nature connection it means that our actions and lifestyles have led to a deterioration of the natural environment um and i think that probably most of us are potentially responsible for some of that to some degree but then there are certain aspects of our society which are actually are responsible for for more of it and i'd say for example the way the supermarkets and their sort of profit motives have driven to sort of led to changes in farming you know and stripping out hedgerows to be farming to become more efficient and all that sort of thing are responsible for that um but then when i think back to when i was a child it seems to me, you know, I lived in a small town, we didn't have a car, and my perception was that urban areas and rural areas were really very different. Um, if we went to the countryside, it was a it was a sort of a joy to go to the countryside and a conscious decision to go to the countryside, really, and, and not easy to do it without without a car. Um and and therefore urban and rural areas were very different and the lifestyles i think were very different generally speaking between urban and rural areas now i think that that's changed significantly um it seems to me that most people wherever they live live sort of an urban lifestyle um and really the difference between urban and rural areas is really a matter just of the de the density of development that you find really uh, and but people's lifestyles tend to be very similar in the sorts of things that they do that that might be a bit of an exaggeration an overgeneralization but i think there's at least certain certainly something in that i think that as a sort of as a race if you like what we need to be doing is reversing that regression of nature which is we've really allowed to creep up on us um over many years and by doing that and i think to a certain degree you know there are things happening to try and do that you know like trying to re-establish biodiversity and all this sort of thing you know positive gains in biodiversity um but if we're able to do that then it seems because most people sort of are have sort of unconsciousness in relation to this but those people would benefit because i think that people enjoy going out into pleasant green attractive environments and they find it fulfilling and sort of important to their mindfulness so although overall many people may be unconscious to this i think that by tackling it actually would improve the the sort of the lifestyles of most people and just on wilderness if i could make a point it does seem to me like I've, I've sort of been my wife really got me into the watching this but 
I don't know if you've if you've seen Ben Fogel's programs of where he goes and visits people who live in sort of the wilderness all over the world, which is quite interesting. But it strikes me that that's always going to be the minority of people. And actually, if everybody lived in that sort of lifestyle, then there wouldn't be very many areas of wilderness left. So therefore, it's a question of actually really try to look after those wild areas and perhaps every giving everybody a, a bit of a share of a reasonable access to those wild areas rather than letting a relatively small proportion of people actually hold on to them if that makes sense so sorry i've rambled on a bit thanks dave um yeah is there life beyond the national trust and english heritage um ian have you got any thoughts on what on dave's reflections Can you unmute? Yes, David. Yeah, I I agree with you about the unconscious connection um, being the problem. It's um it's the opposite of what I call mindfulness, which is what, one of the reasons I called what I what I do natural mindfulness is that we live in a in a world that's sort of manipulated and manufactured, and it's and it's manufactured mindlessness, which which I thought of natural mindfulness being an antidote to the the mindlessness so i when people sort of say what's mindfulness i said well it's the opposite of mindlessness and there's two forms of mindlessness one is one is purposeful mindlessness which is it's almost like damaging something on purpose um, but it, and it, and we would we would judge it as mindless but it's it's purposeful damage and it that could be purposeful damage for profit um, and most a lot of the time it is i think some of the worst damage to nature is because um, it's a business doing it, and there's shareholders that demand that that business does it, and those those companies are bigger than nations now. So, a company can move into the rainforest and say, "Well, you know, if the government tries to stop this, we'll sue you for loss of business, a loss of profit." Um, awful thing. I mean, you know, this is why I, this is why um, you know people were pushing for for eco side. You know that these big companies purposefully damaging you know, murdering a, a, a natural space and, and a, a, an ecosystem. Um, so so there's, the, there's the purposeful malicious uh, uh, mindlessness, but then there's also automatic pilot, which human beings go on to when we're stressed. When I'm stressed and I jump in my car and I'm driving on a road I always drive on, if I'm stressed, I end up driving to the wrong place. Many years ago, I drove home to the wrong house because I was coming home from work and I was so stressed, I'd forgotten that I'd moved. And I was, <laughs> I was actually driving the opposite way to where I now lived because I was so stressed out, I was driving to my old house. Um, and, and when I realized that so much of what I do, if I'm stressed, is just automatic. I'm not thinking about it. And, and I think that's the vast majority of people. So raising consciousness, raising awareness through uh, you know, programs like the Ben Fogel program that you mentioned, David, you know, it's great. Uh, it's a chance for people to, you know, watch that and engage with it. And I, I've always believed that when we connect, we care. And what we care about, we protect and we nurture. Now, most people have disconnected from nature, so they're no longer caring for it and they're no longer protecting it. But if we can get more people to engage and to, and to get meaningful connection from it, and there's some wonderful science out there now which is showing how just by standing in nature and just listening to the birds, listening to water, um, just looking at wonderful landscapes, smelling the petrichor coming off the ground and feeling, you know, even touching, tactile touching, go searching for things in nature and we reduce stress levels. It, it almost puts the body back onto the parasympathetic nervous system, which most of us live on sympathetic nervous system, fight and flee and freeze. Whereas the parasympathetic is rest and digest and repair. And once now, we, now we're realizing that actually there's benefit in us to our health being in natural spaces. There's a big push now um, towards being with nature, connected to nature, either directly by having guided um, and, and, and access to places um, or by just or doing it digitally as well. There's a lot of evidence that shows that you, we get a lot of, we can reduce stress by watching um, a nature program on the television. Now it's not the best way, but I think to sort of 
say to what you were saying before, David, about you can't have everybody going out into, into or was that you, Simon, saying about everybody going out into nature at the same time into the wilder spaces because there's not enough of them and will damage them. Um, there is some, there is a need, I think, to be able to you know, look, to be able to access nature and people that live in cities and towns to be able to access um, more manufactured or maybe um, dig even digitally produced nature so that they can benefit from it, connect with it, and also then put their hand up and say stop when they see real nature and they see natural spaces um, under threat and under attack from uh, conscious damage. Um, hmm. Thank you. Um, Ken. Good to see you back online, Ken. I know yeah, thanks, Pete. And my weekend was very weird. We can talk about that later. It turns out that there was a connection that had failed. Anyway, good to the see everybody. Connection. <laughs> yeah, right. The nature connection failed exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, good to see everybody from the Sunday group. Um, you know, where where do you start with something like this? I mean, you know, people can make me feel guilty because I'm neither vegan nor vegetarian. I live in an urban area just over the line from Washington, DC. There is a national park here, but my physical, the closest physical connection I can get to quote unquote nature is walk into the grocery store about five minutes away. But we have behind our building, I mean, it's, it's a controlled environment. This is not wild, but we do have rabbits, birds, I've seen turtles, um, and apparently there are even foxes around here that <laughs> migrated out from the national park. Um, and uh, I mean, how do I put this? I probably could not survive in a quote, purely natural environment, whatever exactly that is. I don't drive, um, but um, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not self-reliant. I'll be the first to admit that I am not self-reliant. I am not particularly tech savvy. I don't do home ma maintenance and repair. I need help with all of that stuff. One of the problems I have personally with, it's so complicated. I wish it was easier. <laughs> um, with a lot of the talk about environmentalism is some people, you know, back to the land, you got to build your own house. You got to be self-reliant. You got to do this. You got to do that. Some of us aren't going to be very good at that. We would need a lot of help. I also like being in a cosmopolitan environment. You know, I don't know if I could exist without my music. You can see all the CDs and the books and stuff. They're all here. Um, and Ian, I may as well tell you, I'll try to make this really brief. I've known Pete for over 30 years from the international music community. I'm a music journalist. We have some we don't have completely similar tastes, but it hits in a lot of areas. Uh, I do think in general, and I am in the United States, and I suspect that that may make my reactions to all of this somewhat different from everyone else's. I don't know. I hope that doesn't sound like American nationalism or some kind of America is great bullshit, because I don't believe in that. Um, uh, you know, the, the over here, the suburban sprawl is still going on and automobile dependency is still going on and there's plenty of conspicuous consumption and waste. I do not believe I could talk to a, pardon me, Trump supporter about environmental issues because they just don't care. They're either ignorant or stupid or short-sighted or too nationalist or even possibly manipulated by the system to be what they are. And I know that's a long discussion. We could be here all day. Um, have you written books? How do I reach you directly? Are you on the Campfire website, email address? That yeah, I'm, 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 on the, I'm on the network, on Pete's network. Yeah, and, and I, I did write a book in 2018, uh, a guidebook to um, the healing power of nature connection. So and, uh, and, oh, go on, I'm just showing these. Greta <laughs> you know. oh. This one is, is like, um, you know, it's a compendium of stuff by different people, and I even recognize some of them. Anyway. Thanks, Ken. Yeah, it'd be good to get uh, beyond the labeling, actually. I mean, um, that's something that we've been discussing a lot on the Sundays. Mm -hmm. um, to it'd, be great, it'd be great for you to join the Sunday group sometime if you can. 
I've been, I, yeah, I've been trying to get onto the Sunday group, but it's a Sunday and I, I'm so busy on Saturdays that I'm, my wife won't give me a Sunday as well. But uh, I, I will get I will get there. I mean, Pete, we've 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 got this started now, Pete. So it's, yeah. uh, you know, it, it will happen. It will be. Yeah. We'll get there. But I, pre I appreciate that, Ken, as well. And just to let you know, um, there's a there's a growing there's a growing group of natural mindfulness guides now from America. Um, and, and well, all over the world. I mean, I've trained over 500 people from over 30 different countries. So there's interest there. Um, and again, it's, it's that I have people guiding in, or there are people guiding in cities and, and towns because you know, as you say, nature, nature, is, nature is there. And if, if you know, we only saw in lockdown, when you, when, you, when, you switch, when you switch human activity off, you know, one of the things I loved to do was was go down into the towns that were there was nobody there, but there were there were trees growing out of buildings, and there was there was there was you know all the, the weeds had come back because people had stopped using um, weed killer in the in the towns, and it was there were animals wandering around in some towns just just, just because there was you know, access to food and there were no people about, and it's almost like it was almost apocalyptic. It was like watching one of these these movies where you just watch how quickly everything comes back. Reclaiming their rightful space. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Diane. Diane, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> as usual now, my, my brain's going around and around. This frequently happens when these sort of discussions start going. Um, just geographically, physically, my location. I actually live very close to two things that people love I live extremely close to the sea um, it's only well two minutes by car um, or 10 minutes if you walk um, and I live pretty close like just a, yeah it's not many miles to the new forest as well I thought you were going to mention Dan Aston Gregory then. You need to live close to him. Yeah, I've not met him. So, I, you know, I don't think of him automatically as being in Southbourne, you see. Um, <laughs> you mentioned Petrichor, Ian. Um, and actually, one of the things in lockdown that my mum experienced, my mum, decades and decades of hay fever. And I mean, she has huge problems with all sorts of things. She's allergic to masses of foods and all sorts of stuff. But something that was fabulous was she said, the other day when I was out, I actually smelt petrichor. <laughs> and it was something she'd not smelt in years, you know, and it was obviously just quite an amazing thing. So, so yeah, the lockdown was pretty cool for certain things anyway, um, which was great. Um, but the, the re main reason I wanted to sort of say something was actually something that gives me hope. And when you were asked about, you know, are people becoming more nature connected or whatever, there is definitely a movement, I would say, um, my grandchildren, I've got twin grandchildren, um, and the nursery school that they went to, and it's not a kind of alternative nursery, it's very mainstream nursery, they used to take the kids out into the forest, and before they went into the forest, they would say, please tree, can we come into the forest? And they would actually ask permission. Now, I'm sure it was done with a great deal of enthusiasm, noisiness and all sorts of crazy energies that you get from three-year-old and four-year-old children, um, which would have been wonderful. But I, I loved the fact they were doing that. Um, and now the school they go to, and this is very much a mainstream school um, that they're in, um, they go out, they will be doing forest skills. Um, over over time so that's kind of cool um so yeah personally i go out barefoot outside my door <laughs> i've got i'm very lucky i have a little tiny patch of grass um where i grow a few roses and i have this lovely relationship with these roses and um and it's great and i go and hang up my washing which is on the next patch over and um i go barefoot and it's quite funny because i freaked out one of my neighbors when it was really frosty out there one day and we were talking she suddenly looked down and she went aren't you cold and i said well yeah it's cold but it's okay you know <laughs> and this and it's great to kind of just do that grounding into into the grass and that's in an urban setting um you know and it you know we just take it where we can but something as people have been talking where you've been talking about kind of are things changing as well um 
I, I wonder what the Attenborough effect might be because I'm, you know, the, the, the number of programmes that have been produced um, where David Attenborough doing his thing and talking in, in the way he does. Um, yeah, it's just a question I've got in my mind. And yes, David, thank you for the point you said about people living an urban life, even when they're in the countryside. And so that's, I'm just going to ponder that point. So thank you, David. And that's the end. Thanks, Diane. Yeah. Um, Janine, um, Ian, did you want to come back on anything that Dan said? Um, um, yeah, the, the forest school is, is growing and growing and growing. I mean, I've, I, I've been working with a local, before lockdown, I was working with a, a local forest school where the head teacher and one of the teachers had actually um, set up a forest school within the school so that they could use it not just as a forest school, but they could do some research and they could gather some evidence of were the children benefiting actually from having forest school on the school site. And there were certain children that found sitting in a classroom all day and, and being told to stay quiet and, 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 and perform as you, as you have to perform within a school. They found that those children, because they had access to a forest school, almost as a, as a therapeutic um, process, um, enabled them to then cope much better when they came back inside. So it's almost like, you know, playtime used to be the time when you went outside and you, you kind of, um, you, know, you were able to sort of rebalance and maybe ground yourself down <laughs> and be able to come back in and then sit in a classroom for the rest of the afternoon. Now playtime seems to be the time that kids go out and fill themselves full of sugar and, and yeah. stare at a screen for, you know, that they couldn't stare about when they were on the, on TV. And we've sort of lost that breaks being actually somewhere where you go out and you you, reg, you re, rebalance and regulate yourself and, yeah. and and prepare yourself to be able to you know spend actually spend some time in in very unnatural surroundings thank you thanks janine just to say Ian, i think we all we've we've always um filled ourselves with sugar well I, I did and I went to school mm. a, lot, a long time ago and it was just grabbing as many things from the tuck shop as <laughs> <laughs> but um I, I know what you're saying um and by the way I don't listen to fools so I I didn't observe the lockdown at all I, mean, <laughs> I you know I mean I'm not I'm not taking any notice of you know I mean I, I, I just thought it was ridiculous Anyway, so yeah, I, I was off and out walking like in Covent Garden, completely empty. It was amazing. Um, yeah, I mean, this is a huge thing for me. Um, oh, where do I start? I mean, when I was a child, I remember I used to, I, I was taken to my mum's work because, well, anyway, I was taken as a two or three year old to my mum's work and there was this sort of garden outside and I remember I was very very young I, it was before I could speak probably and just lying on the grass and I can still remember the smell of privet and which is one of my favorite smells and the black a blackbird singing and I listened to that for years and I would just look in the grass and have my own little thing so I think I was always <laughs> like this um, but I know when I've done shamanic work um, we would go into nature and we would ask the, the tree, you know, that tree has got its own personal space. <laughs> and you kind of ask if you can go and sit by it or, I don't know, swing from it or something. Um, and it was just so beautiful. I just remember it feeling so beautiful to learn that, even though I sort of always known that. Um, and also, and I've been trying to remember the name of a book. What was that book where he went around Peru with all those 10 things that he had to find? The Celestine Prophecy. The Celestine Prophecy, yeah. which I love, actually. I love mm. that book. But on, on one of them, it, they, they talk about, I can't remember what it was, but they talk about connecting with nature. And, and I, I did that for a long time, which is you, you, you sit somewhere and you look at a tree and you try and see its aura. Um, which is amazing. You just keep staring at a tree. Um, but what I do, I was over the heath with my friend the other day and, and, and I just said, can you just be quiet for a moment? And we just listened to the birds for a long, long time. And it was just, I mean, that gets you into, into nature. But I don't know what you do, Ian, but um, <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of interested in this sort of 
I don't know, forest bathing or whatever they call it. I've, no, I've never been, but mm -hmm. I mean, I'd, I'd love to do something. Well, yeah, I do a form of, it's a form of forest bathing, but you don't have to be in a forest. You can be on a beach or you can be on a Cotswold hillside. Um, you can be anywhere else, um, but it's the same principle. It's, it's mindful attention in nature. Forest bathing is bathing in the atmosphere of the forest. It was only invented in the 1980s, but it was based on a, a Shinto, Shinto um, sort of philosophy of being connected with nature, but it, it was brought about by the Japanese parks um, because they had all these parks that were costing money by the Japanese government. Nobody was in them because everybody was too busy working and there was a problem with people overworking. They even have they even have a, a name name um, of a death from overwork in Japan. There's, there's actually a Japanese word that means death by overwork. And so they, they put these two ideas together to try and encourage more um, business people to de-stress by coming out into the forest. And the, and the Japanese um, scientists have done it in South Korea as well. I've got I've got scientist friends um, from both Japan and South Korea who are, are still doing are still doing um, research and things now. And they had they found something outstanding um evidence um I, you know i've intuitively and instinctively known that there's the and that most you know most people that nature lovers that have done the same as you as children you kind of know you don't need science to tell you that there's a connection there but it but we live in a world where the science um you know people that are unconscious <laughs> you know, unconscious to to nature consciousness in many ways you know they need the science because you know that's how they've been taught the world works is through what we are told and what experts tell us and so therefore if you can have somebody who you know is an expert because their their academic career has enabled them and their experience has enabled them to do it saying and, and showing how nature helps and nature heals us um then that's great but there's even research being done now about how we heal nature which is wonderful so there's scientists that are friends of mine who are actually looking at how and I've done this experiment myself, by the way, and I, I encourage you to try this yourselves. I've, I, we've planted an arboretum in our village with lots of different, we've all, we all have ownership of certain trees. And typically there are some people that don't look after their trees. Um, I go up and I, I speak to my tree every morning. I, I speak to it. I just say, oh, look, well done. Um, I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm just doing that in the same way as I talk to my dog. You know, my dog doesn't understand what I'm saying to her, but I have a, I have a relationship with her. I talk to her and, um, and and so I, I'm the same when I go up to see the trees. I, I, I go around and I make sure make sure they're okay and they're healthy and I water them when it's a drought and all the rest. And the tree the trees are looking wonderful. And um, there's a, my wife has a tree that I look after that's absolutely blooming now. And people keep saying, "Oh, we're going to give a prize to this tree because it's the best tree in the arboretum." And I go, "Well, I've been caring for it. I look after it." And I said, "And here's the tree, exactly the same tree that somebody else had had planted there, exactly the same tree, and it's withered because." nobody's been looking after it okay it's not had some water there but it, it i've started watering it but it's it there's a definite you know there is definite connection between giving attention giving conscious attention to something that's alive um shows that there is growth if it's if it's positive attention and our attention is our actions and what we do i don't want to get too out there although there is some science from a Japanese uh, chap that looked at ice crystals, water crystals. Um, and uh, he did some great experiments with water crystals. Uh, Dr. Emoto, I think his name was, but uh, maybe that's a story for another time. Um, but some very fascinating. So the science is great now because the science is actually proving what most of us have intuited, instinctively known, felt um, in our, deep down in our gut. Um, and uh, and that's, that's great. That's great to see. Great to have. Thanks, Ian. Um, Danny, you've got your hand up. Hi, yeah. Um, yeah, I think going back to before what was being said about um, whether or not there's a shift, and I think what was mentioned about forest schools, obviously um, for us, England uh, isn't too great on that, but Wales and Scotland have been exceptional in terms of how they're educating their children. There's a lot more nature-based learning, free play, child-led learning. Um, here, I think there's not enough schools that are following that route and there's definitely a lot of um, children that are suffering as a result of it. There's a lot of increased mental health issues and stress and anxiety amongst children and I think a lot of that has got to do with the education system and not having enough movement and access to nature as they're growing up in, in naturally the way they should have. Um, I do think people are trying to change that and I think obviously there's a lot of adults that are also trying to 
provide more access for children and for for other adults by becoming guides like Ian's doing um, and you've got the forest bathing thing but yeah it seems to be more of a recent thing I don't think here that was something that was massively around um, and I know somebody said before about sugar when we were kids but for me as as a child the education system wasn't as restrictive in terms of movement um, and the, the amount of learning that was placed on children at a young age, that's definitely increased. So the learning that children have to do at like five and six, when we were kids probably wasn't done till sort of like eight or nine. Um, so I think I think things are changing and they need to as well. I don't know whether I missed something there. There was something else I wanted to say and I can't remember what it was. <laughs> Don't worry. Thank you, Tony. I'd like to ask you in a bit more about the guides. We were talking on our conversation mm. about um, empowering members of the community to step up and how that could have quite an effect in terms of what um, what the community could actually do collectively as well as those people individually. Yeah, yeah. Well, in 20, 2014, I, I went on my first walk. I took a, a group of 15 people out into nature and I ran it like a coaching session. I ran it like corporate training, which is what I was doing, but it was it was just training and coaching in, in nature, with nature. Um, and... Um, Two people on that on that walk turned around to me and said, "Can you teach me how to do this? Can you teach me how to guide people? I'd like to do that." And it, I suddenly realised that that was that was a that if I was going to make a difference, taking fifteen people out on on a walk, um, fifteen for a start was too many. It's much better to take sort of six, <laughs> you know, six or so, <laughs> around six people out for a mindful walk in nature. Um, but I realised that I needed more people in order to do that, and so that's why I, I sort of. Um, I, I sort of switched my attention to sharing what I was doing with others to enable them, to empower them and enable them to, to do that for themselves. Um, what, I, what, I, what I aimed to do, because it was supposed to be, you know, this is about something that's natural, it had to align with who they are. It had to align with their nature. So I'm very, I'm very keen that people don't follow a script. There's, you know, there are certain things. Obviously, you know, I have, I have a sort of a guidebook of how to do it so that you, you tick all the boxes, health and safety, and things like that, which you know we need to adhere to. But in terms of the majority of how that's done, is it's, it's down to people's unique connection with nature, sharing your unique, true connection with nature, and if people feel free to do that then they get the biggest impact with with others um, and um, what's what's interesting is it, I say I've trained over 500 people to guide in 30 different countries now never intended it to be that it, it's become that which which shows that there is a there is a, a wanting to do it but the, the majority of people that want to do it are people who tend to or or are great at nature can you know they want to connect with nature and share that have a passion for that but there's all these there's all these hoops we've got to jump through in order to be able to to deliver that and i think one of the hardest things is you know the nhs here in the uk are now starting to prescribe nature connection um and and but there's you know who's going to do it Who, who's going to suddenly take people out um what's wonderful is i've got yo i've got yoga teachers i've got therapists i've got coaches i've got teachers i've got psychologists i've got psychiatrists who are all going i want to take people out into nature and i want to i want to help them be themselves because this unwellness is coming from people not being allowed to be themselves and so this what's interesting is with the guides it's about the guides actually starting to recognize that even you know even myself when i was guiding i wasn't being myself i was being a trainer i was doing what i'd been taught to do i was i was kind of going through the process and it wasn't it didn't work and i found the only way what i do works is when i allow it to be natural i allow it to grow and i and i plant seeds now i don't they, they dig those seeds up a week later to see if they're growing or not because that's not what you do in that you dig the seeds up to see if they're growing you'll probably kill most of them um, so the idea for me is i follow what i call natural law i follow i try not to run what i do as a business it's not an organization it's an organism and i, I it's not you know i i don't take responsibility for how it grows and it flourishes i i i kind of just i just go with it i go i always say i go with the growth um, i follow the flow and follow the growth with it and it's something it, I, was, I wanted to share this because i think it's quite quite important about people talk to me about natural law and there are some natural laws like gravity is a natural law but i heard um, neil oliver 
give a great description of natural law uh, just a few days ago. I'll share, I'll share the, the interview with people afterwards if they're interested to sort of hear him say it, but I'll try and, I'll try and say what, what I resonated with and I loved. And he said that there are, he said, with, with natural law, he said, what we're doing is we're interfering with it. And he said, it's like holding a beach ball under the water. The beach ball is supposed to float on top of the water. If you took your hands off it, it would float on the water. It wouldn't go under the water at all. But we can, we can, as human beings, we have the ability to push it under the water. So we're going against natural law. And it takes a lot of energy to keep that ball down. And as soon as we take that away, it'll come up again. And that reminded me of the conversation I had about going into the towns and the cities during lockdown. Once you took the force of the people away that was going against nature, nature was enabled to, to flourish. I've got a World War II um, camp in a forest, in, uh, you know, very close to where I live. And I discovered it once walking in this pristine forest with only deer and nobody ever goes there. And I'm walking through and I found this whole army camp, prisoner of war camp, buried, literally buried in a forest, covered in moss, covered in trees. I found air raid shelters still there. And I, I would have loved to have found that as a child. I would have been in there all the time. But it was just amazing how nature over a relatively short period of time had completely um, grown back because the force of humanity going against nature had been removed and taken away from it. And this, this, this sort of idea is, and, and where the hope comes from, is you know, that force it would take to push, a, push a, a beach ball below the waterline, to try and hold it there, that, that's a lot of energy going against nature. And I think as human beings, we, we haven't got enough energy to be pushing against nature. And for every person that develops some more nature consciousness and every person that wants to then become a guide to reach more people to ripple out to more people pollinate more people with nature consciousness that's one less person that's that's going against nature and one more person that's going with nature and as more and more people start to say no i want to protect and maybe not protect all of nature i mean if the whole planet was covered in trees i mean i don't even think that 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 would be natural we're here because we're part of nature we're we're we, you know we are nature therefore you know, we don't know what we're here for. So it may be that nature does know what we're here for. Um, somebody said to me the other day, they said, well, may maybe human beings are here because we're going to help the planet to pollinate the universe. And what we'll do is we'll cause it to explode. And what it'll do, it'll blast all our DNA across the universe. And maybe someday, millions of years in the future, part of our DNA will drop onto a barren planet. And, and all of a sudden, life will start on there. And the whole purpose of life on Earth now is to pollinate the rest of the universe. And I just thought, well, that's, that's scary. I don't want to consider that. But who am I as a human being to say that that's not what the human race on this planet is part of you know we're a fungus maybe and and we have to blast our spores across the universe um just a theory um but you know i i, I love this idea and one of the reasons I'm, I'm trying to train as many guides as i can to do what i've been doing is to just move move us back into flow and and just to go with it and allow allow things to happen um rather than fight against natural law so Thank you. Yeah, that, um, that ball analogy was actually, uh, that Neil Oliver's um, analogy was in the interview you did with James Dellingpole. That's think. right. That's right. I watched it. I watched it a couple of days ago. Well yeah. worth watching. Very, uh, very enlightening, entertaining uh, session. Yeah. Um, Danny, you've still got your hand up. Have you remembered the other point? Yes, yeah, sorry. It was a bit of a combination of a couple of things people had said. It was Ian talking about protecting and somebody else mentioned something about everybody going into the wilderness en masse. Um, and then in terms of the fact that things are changing, and obviously lockdown caused a lot of people, somebody said before about causing a lot of people go, to go back into nature. And then we saw the disastrous impact of that and the kind of rubbish and horrendous mess that people were making of things. And I think a big part of nature connectedness um, is is about not is, is guiding that connectedness, but also from what Ian said, guiding and protecting, and sort of like informing people of how to look after what it is that they want to experience as, in, as part of their nature connection. I think that explains what I was trying to say. <laughs> yeah, we we can't not damage nature. I mean, it's impossible. I you know I 
you know, I, I step, I come down, come down to my office in the night sometimes, and I hear a crunch as I've stepped on a snail, and it's like, well, I didn't intend to. It wasn't, I, I wasn't trying to. If anything, my intention is not to harm, but I appreciate that I will harm. I will harm. Um, every, you know, and, and nature doesn't feel harmed. I mean, you know, animals are destroying and, and damaging nature all the time, and and our, you know, our ancestors that you know, if we go back far enough that we're living with nature, they destroy areas of nature, but they're doing it in ways that they know it can recover and it's sustainable. And I think, you know, one of, if, if there's anything that, you know, I try and try and get across to people um, with, with guiding and on walks is if we, if we gave back a little bit more than we took, um, and that can start with the breath. You know, I, I think if I take a breath in of lovely rich oxygen um, from, from plants and trees, I try and breathe out more carbon dioxide than the oxygen I take it in. I don't know if I managed to do that, but you know, with breathing, with breathing exercises, there's an opportunity to, I think, breathe out more than you take in. Um, and it's, it, you know, if you if you have that philosophy of, you know, giving back more than we take, I think, you know, then things can can and could change. You know, there's a, there's eight over eight billion of us on the planet. You know, if everybody, you know, did their, their little bit, um, it can make a massive difference quite quickly. Um, it would take one or two people a very long time to do something. But what I'm learning through Nature Connection World is the more people we have in there that are active and doing things, um, lots, lots and lots of people can do things much quicker. You know, I've only got 24 hours in a day, but I have much more than that when I have people like Kev and I have, uh, you know, and I have Maria and um, Danny and Alison. And they're the only ones I've got on my screen at the moment. I know that they're out there doing this as well. So I, I get, I, you know, my time has been quadrupled just with those people in terms of the effect I can have and they can have that effect too there's this lovely idea in nature that things ripple out um, and, and nothing is asking for anything back in return is it you know when a bee comes to a flower and starts um, you know starts pollinating from a flower the, the flower is not turning around slapping some tax on it um, in the same way as the sun is not taxing the flower for taking energy from the sun to create glucose and produce sugars that, that the animals are then feeding on and we feed on and it's only us that tax everything and try and put a price on everything um, nature shows us it's all about it's all about sharing and giving and then you get back um, fair exchange of energy in nature and if you don't get back a fair exchange of energy it was your time was up <laughs> and then you, you you become you become insect food <laughs> Throwing stones into pools and watching the ripples. Yeah, I love it. I love it. There's a friend of mine, um, David, ha Dr. David Hamilton. He tells a lovely story about a frog on a lily pad. And he said, you drop a, you drop a, drop a pebble into a pond and those ripples, and he talks about kindness, ripples of kindness. He said, you drop a pebble of kindness into a pond and that ripple goes across. And on the far side of the pond, there's a little frog sitting on the lily pad that just goes, oh, like that. Oh, it just gives him a nice little feeling of, oh, that was nice. And he said, but you never know. You don't know that's happened, but you just put those ripples out anyway. Um, and it doesn't, the ripples don't just go out. There's an energy that goes down deep as well. Yeah, I mentioned to you the Theo Simon talk on kindness. Yes, yes. The ripples from that talk alone that camp out 2019 uh, were quite considerable, I yeah, think. Kind, kindfulness, mindfulness and kindfulness. I kindfulness. think those are two lovely. Awarefulness, yeah. mindfulness and kindfulness. Yeah. Okay. How's your connection? Uh, fine. <laughs> you know, um, <clears throat> I do wonder, as with a lot of these conversations, if because I am in the United States, my perspective may be different or more weird or more nerve wracked or whatever, <laughs> because capitalism is so bloody dominant over here. And even trying to reduce the power of the fossil fuel industry is very difficult. And people want the American dream and suburban house and all that goes with it. And I'm wondering, you know, I realize this sounds very negative, sorry, but <laughs> I wonder how much time we've really got to prevent mass extinctions, death of coral reefs, drowning of coastal cities, complete loss of rare ecological niches. Do you, I mean, I know this is almost like a cartoon of an example, but Donald Trump is, of course, a seething example of everything that's wrong. And I mean, is it even conceivable that if you took someone like that on a quote unquote nature walk, that they might possibly change 
um, some of their attitudes. I mean, I, I can't get, I, I, you know, what is pure nature? I don't know. I mean, you can go to the back of the building. There's a sidewalk there and some trees. And that's where I see the rabbits and maybe where I saw the fox. Maybe I saw a turtle, you know, lots of birds, lots of birds. We have that. But I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm in an urban area. It is not a forest. Um, I'm trying to take notes on all of this. It's not easy. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'll probably have to watch the recording again. But life has just become so awkward and weird. And it is difficult to take everything in. I do believe that certainly in the United States and probably globally, we do need deep systemic change. There is an organization called AVAAZ, which is a kind of, mm. describe this, international um, network. I don't know what to call it. Mm. It, it, it. Advocacy about environment and war and peace and, and all these different things. And I really do believe that all issues these days are global. Um, and, uh, you know, AVAAZ, I, 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 it's probably avaz.org. I don't know. Yeah, yeah I've heard of it. I've heard of it. Yeah. Thanks, okay. Ken. I mean, the, the flip side of the extinction question you raise, and I'd be interested to ask Ian this um, eco fundamentalism, a term I haven't really heard much of. Um, Simon Elmer, who I've mentioned quite a lot on Campfire, I'm just posting an article he did in UK Column about. The politics of environmental fundamentalism, which he sees as the successor to COVID fundamentalism, mm. um, and that sort of links in with fifteen-minute cities and all that. What's your view on that, Ian? Um, I've not I've not heard of that either. I'll have, I'll have to I'll have to look into that. I I was picking up on on what Ken was saying in terms of, of Donald Trump. <laughs> Imagine if Donald Trump. I mean, I don't know Donald Trump. I mean, I I. I I know what I see and what I hear. Um, I haven't. I don't know him. I mean, I don't even know my wife, and we've been together for, for many years. But I, I don't know her deep down. Um, you know, we try. You know, you try to to sort of know people like that. Um, but the 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 thing is, see, Donald Trump's true nature might be to destroy the planet. That might there might be some people whose nature is that, because I you know I only know my nature. And mm-hmm. and and I I was taught that nature was about our, our nature was survival of the fittest. Now, in our nature, it was we were all trying to win. But I've never felt that way. I've never felt like I want to win. I do like to win games, and I you know, but I don't like to cheat to win. So I had to dis- sort of work out what my nature was. And what's really interesting is I don't think it's survival of the fittest. I don't think if human the human race work to the premise of survival of the fittest we'd have been here for for very long there would have just been a few you know this this sort of elite group of super fit people bullying everybody else but we we wouldn't have evolved i i think there's there's more going on there's more to our nature i think part of our true nature is you know we we are we are gatherers we we like to build community we like to belong to community i mean i've watched I, I get a bit of a thrill if I see a revenge movie and somebody who's downtrodden turns up and comes back and kind of like wins the day. I kind of like, I get a feeling I, I like about that, but I get a much stronger feeling when I see a, a YouTube video of a whole group of people coming together to save a whale or coming together to dig people out of the rubble of a disaster, putting their own lives. I get a much stronger feeling about that, which tells me that that's my na- My nature is I resonate with that. I think it's not just survival of the fittest. Survival of the fittest only comes in and and could well come in when we are under threat. When I feel stressed, I I, I try and win. When my back's against the wall and I don't think I can talk my way out of it and I can't laugh my way out of it and I I can't escape, uh, my only thing left to me is, is, is fight or die. And, and that is, that's where sort of, I think survival of the fittest comes from, if we were there. I actually think we've survived. I, th- I think the people who've survived <laughs> any sort of human disaster in the past have been the misfits. I think, I think it's survival of the misfits. I think it's the people who went left when everybody else went right. Um, it was the dinosaurs, the little dinosaurs that scurried off and went left when all the big dinosaurs went right. And, and they weren't there when when the, you know, they were further away when the meteor hit. We, we all seem to gather, what human beings do is we all gather into big, massive 
groups of people in cities and everything. If the sea level rises, everybody that's on the on on, on sea level and, and slightly above will be gone. I'm not. I'm not down there. I can look down at floods where I live. I'm up on the hill. I'm out the way. I'm 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 sort of a, a little bit eccentric because I wander off into the woods with people. I've probably got more more chance of surviving rapid water rising now than everybody that's going to work down in the city and is in that town and that place and, and you know on, in those places i you know mammals came after dinosaurs now mammals were the misfits of the time they weren't that useful were they in, in the age of the dinosaur but the dinosaurs have all gone now and 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 now we've 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 had the rise of the mammals and and that's where we supposedly have come from in terms of you know we've um we've become the naked ape but um yeah, I, I, I have a feeling that it's going to be the people that go left when everybody else goes right that survive, and it will be those odd, odd people that are edge walkers. Um, and so because that's, I think that's our nature. I think our nature is also to be free. Um, I kind of feel for me, if I, if I could win, if I could win, find whatever I'd lost, if I was loved, um, if I was always right and I was free, I think I'd be pretty happy because the, op the op opposite of that is I'm trapped, I'm always wrong, Everybody hates me, and I'm lost. And There's so, so much we could go into. And I <laughs> love that discussion on being lost and then finding. That we were talking about. Yeah, the yeah. Between it took lost. me years. It took me over fifty yeah. years, Pete, to realise that the opposite, the opposite of uh, lot of lose was also find. Because yeah. I couldn't win. I couldn't win back most of what I lost in my life, particularly my parents. I lost my parents when they were quite young, and I couldn't win them back but I could find something from that experience that enabled me to carry on and, and, and build something from that. So, um, yeah. Uh, I'm going to have to go into fast forward mode because we've got <laughs> five minutes left. We on answered the any of the questions we promised we, to we answer. We might overrun here. slightly, so feel free to hang on with us. We'll probably go five or 10 minutes over time, but um, Alison, you've got, had your hand up. Oh, um, yeah, I just wanted to touch upon um, what Ken was sort of saying about, um, you know, if we take people out for a walk, can we actually help them sort of step to nature? Can we help them sort of see, I suppose, the light for want of a better word? And actually, that's what I'm sort of experiencing with a lot of my clients is people are coming in distress because they're feeling the isolation. Um, you know, people are seeking answers because actually they want to make a difference to the world. They want to make a difference to themselves, but they don't know how to do it because my experiencing actually with people at the moment, especially since COVID is this capitalism, if you like, has, has, has risen its head again and people are striving to stay alive. They're trying to do the best they can. And we're, we're, we're almost breathing in, especially in Western culture, this ideal of, we're only good enough if we're making lots of money. We're only good enough if we're working all the hours God sends. So, you know, the sort of clients I'm seeing are, um, you know, they want to connect to nature, but they've lost that belief in themselves. They've lost their true nature, you know, if you like. They're actually, they don't know how to do that. They don't know how to trust themselves anymore to know how to do that. So when I do the wellbeing walks, you know, I had a lady on this weekend. For her, it was just, it was absolute magic, if you like. And this is something, you know, I think Ian helps on his guy training, it brings you out, is it was absolutely magic for her to just have that childlike awe. We spent half an hour looking at the bursting buds on blackthorn and then comparing it to hawthorn. And she was like, she was just fascinated. She's like, I thought they were the same thing. And, you know, it was just that childlike wonder and awe that was coming out again. And she had the confidence at the end of that two hours to go out and go, okay, well, actually, I've been meaning to um, reduce my plastic now for about two years, but I haven't felt confident I had to do it. And now you've kind of given me just the kind of little bit of inkling to go, I can do it. And just even though I'm one person, I can make my difference. And that's for me is, is what Nature Connection World is what meeting people like you is all about, is helping that find that one person that believes in themselves enough to go, I can go and make my difference now. So I hope I don't sure that answered anyone's questions in particular, but... <laughs> Um, yeah, that was my little nugget. So, thank you. It's a really important point, and just to, to to know you've made that difference is can be so rewarding. I think. Um, shall we go straight into Simon and then back to Ian? Okay. Yeah. One well, very very quick point is for what, when Ken said about um, taking Donald Trump out into nature. My my response to that is well, don't bother with Donald. Uh, I'm sure there's lots of other more worthy people that would be better off being taken out into nature. 
and have you get a perhaps get a, a better response. Ian. Yeah, what well, sorry, what was the question? <laughs> Just any anything from the last couple of comments you want to respond to? Um yeah, well there there is this thing, there is there's a number of things about going into nature. And and for me, one is 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 it's 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 for some people it's just a little break. It's it's a it's teaching them some way they can release a little bit of the pressure. Um I call that it's the it's finding. It's actually going out and finding your nature, finding your connection with nature, which is lost. I don't think it's something that people teach you. I think it's something that's in us from from childhood. I think we are closer to nature as children because we haven't been, we haven't kind of conformed and we haven't been kind of altered and changed and we don't I think we start living our lives based on other people's expectations from quite a young age and then we we don't actually recognize what we want so so the initial walking is just about finding yourself um, but there's other there's other approaches um, through nature therapies and forest therapies which is very much about he the healing process and the understanding so I always say that a journey into nature is about finding healing understanding and then releasing your true nature now every single element of that is, is challenging you've got to find your nature when you find it you realize there's some healing needs to happen because because otherwise you would have already been living your life based on your true nature so why aren't you what needs healing what barriers need removing from that and, and then once you do that then you've got to understand you know who you are and, and how you can align yourself to that nature so that when you do it you stay well you you actually create value and you you become you know someone that can make a difference and you you, you know you can still keep living the life you like and you know, i i've got the same as you can i've got loads of stuff that are materialistic that i love and i don't want to i don't want to do away with so i've just got to learn how to come to terms with that and get the balance right without offsetting co2 because i've got loads and loads of money i haven't got enough money to offset the co2 i use but i can do other things i can i can help in other ways um, but then finally it's the releasing it's the how do, how do you turn up each day um, being closer to your true nature than you did the day before and for me it's an ongoing journey it's, it's not ending but every day i try and be a bit closer to my nature and then i notice when things uh, are incongruent with my true nature when and and you know taking the the jab you know i've been very vocal about i just knew that was the wrong thing for me i'm not saying it was the wrong thing for other people it's up to them um, but my argument always to people was that i've really really looked to understand this for me my medical history and all sorts of other things that came into that and it's absolutely not right for me now if you can say it's absolutely not it absolutely is right for you based on your nature I'm absolutely fine. I'm absolutely fine with that. And that's the, that's the decision we all should have been given the time to make. Um, but anyway, um, to me, you know, being true to my nature, the gift of that is that I can have a, a flowing life and I can I can make a difference. The downside to that is that I get challenges every single day because there is so much in my life that is not natural. And, and I have to say something and I have to do something if that's the case, even if it means that people disagree with me and don't like me. Um, but hey. This so much ties in with what we've been talking about with deep listening and um, that phrase keeps coming back to me who am i to say i'm right mm. um and we've it's seen just my truth <laughs> various examples of, of that on social media certainly mm. on my um, facebook wall <laughs> but i won't go into them um danny Yeah, it's something Alison was saying that really resonated, and it was that that one lady that she was talking about. Um, and I think that that's that's where you find that balance of not feeling so overwhelmed by all the things you can't change, and then being able to focus on what you can change by helping one person at a time. The only way we're going to have massive cultural change is by individual change. And I think once you can work with those individual people, and then from what you were saying before about the ripple effect of that that's where you get cultural change. Yeah, and how much of that is about doing the inner work and the healing, Ian? Well, you have to start with you. Um, I think, is it, is it um, uh, who's, who's the guy uh, that's done the 12 steps to life? Jordan Peterson, one of the things he says, before you go out and change, try and change the world, you know, sort, tidy your room i think is the thing he said he said to people you know make sure your life's in order make sure and and, I, and it's not for me it's not just you know my outside chaos is a representation of my inner chaos so if my life is not operating well 
I've got to look within to try and find the balance within me. And, and for me, that's what natural mindfulness is. It, it's my, it's the state of being that I, I, I use to, to, to get myself to that state. And I get that in nature. I find nature being in, invested with nature is where I can access my nature and connect with my inner nature. And then it's about bringing that into balance. Um, you know, before I respond to that tweet or before I, you know, go charging off with this idea is I, I just make sure that all the parts of me, all of those, I call them my inner guides, the elements of my true nature, that they're all working and collaborating together, not conflicting with each other, because most of us are very conflicted inside. Um, and we need that, that balance. So you have to have to start with you. And Danny's absolutely right. It's uh, yeah, do, do the work with you and then and then you can be the turn up as the best you. Um, you know, if you, I, I, I'd quickly share this one because I did say this with you before. It's like, I've always, I've always been fascinated with right place, right time. You know, you listen to all these people that have done great things in the world, and they go, "Oh, it's just in the right place at the right time," and that's how I was successful. And I've always thought, well, what I, I can't control time and space. <laughs> you can't, I can't control the place and the time. I need a variable that I have some control over. And I realized it was me. I'm the variable that I can control. So when I'm the right me, I find myself in the right place at the right time more often than when I'm not the right me. And, and, you know, and that, was, that realization was fantastic for me because it was when something didn't work out, when I couldn't change something, when, when the plans weren't actually coming to anything fulfillment, it was because I was the wrong me. I was, I was, I was being some, somebody that other people expected me to be, not turning up as who I expect myself to be. And you know, I'm 62 now, it's easy for me to say that. I, I could, couldn't even say that in my 40s and early 50s. I just, you know. I, I want I didn't want to upset people and I wanted to be I wanted to do what people thought was the right thing so I think we talked on our Sunday zoom about moving into our golden years between 60 and 80 so <laughs> just warming up to that here yeah. and we have an excuse to be grumpy that's the other thing I like <laughs> well it's been a fascinating and enthralling conversation um I'd like to just close by asking you where next with Nature Connection World and the importance of community for you. And also, we're really looking forward to seeing you at Camp Out. Yes, in, yes. In August, which I'll put the link into the chat, um, campout.live. Um, we haven't really talked about what you'll be doing there, but uh, I'm sure it'll be... Oh, we'll work be, something out. We'll work out what I'm going to do. Much wisdom <laughs> to it. Yeah. I haven't planned it yet. <laughs> I probably won't plan it. I'll probably just the best way to be emerging. Turn up and just do something. Yeah. Um, that Nature Connection World, it, it's, it's, it, I say it's growing. It's not me uh, making things happen. I, I'm, I'm constantly planting seeds and talking to some really cool people. I'm looking to bring other people into the, into the community and develop people from within the community to create offer, you know, offerings for people, whether that's um, online. So, so people that can't access Nature Connection and, and can benefit from being part of a community that does, so they can share that. So there's that happening. Um, but also, I'm also um, opening up a place in the in Mighty Networks, which I call the Wilderness. Um, and we have a community, which is a free community. I've, I've used the free model community from Mighty Networks, and it's all free at the moment. But what I recognize is outside of that free community is a very, is a very, is an unexplored space that a small group of us can 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 start pioneers can start going out in and creating value in there so that can become um, a paid membership part of that because what what you find is people people focus on what they pay for um, and you know so many people you know if it's free that with the best will in the world that they'll oh it's free but if I don't go or I don't attend then I don't lose anything and so there is something about actually recognizing what value is and we can't get away from the fact that you know money is is the energy we use to um, create value so so called so um, yeah so that so that's exciting that's happening plus last thing we're also I'm also looking to set up a local Cotswold well-being center here I've I've linked with a landowner that has fifteen thousand acres of space and some lovely lovely holiday glamping pods and safari tents and converted modern barns. And it's looking to start, start moving back, like you're talking about, moving back out into the world um, from this locked in, locked down place, everything going online. So we can create this lovely hybrid between online community where we share with a wider audience and local spaces where, where people can come to for residential um, and, and some real nature connection. Yeah. Thank you. And I think, yeah, like you, we're looking at courses and other 
um, parts of the campfire site where we can do particular things. Mm -hmm. and I mentioned earlier um, Simon's off-grid circle, which we're hoping to get going with, and um, the Trailblazers movement, which is a, a separate micro site. Um, I've just posted in the chat, but we're doing sessions on systemic change. The winter gathering that we did in Glastonbury was all around systemic change. So that will be a thread that we'll be looking to continue through the campfire site. Anyway, I'd like to thank you very much for your time, everyone, and your contributions, and for Ian for your wisdom. Thank um, you. Hop on over to Nature Connection World. If you go on the app of Mighty Networks, it's very handy. You can just flick between communities once you're in. Yeah, there. yeah. I'll pop. Um, I'll pop that. I'll pop a link in the um, under under the. You're gonna you're gonna put this up as a recording, did you say? I think I have, I have some people that wanted to come and see it tonight, yeah. but um, we'll probably come and watch. So what I'll do is I'll pop when you when that's up. I'll pop a link to um, Nature Connection World in the underneath your video. Brilliant. All right. Continue the conversation there. <laughs> yes. Thanks very much, everyone. Good to see you all. Thanks, Thanks very much, all. everyone. Bye. Be well and stay safe. Thank you, Ken. All the best. Thanks, everyone. Nice to meet you. Take care. Bye-bye.